Hello, my name is Kyle Matthews. I'm executive director of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies. Um, we're really pleased to continue a discussion today as part of the AI and COVID-19 Disinformation Initiative, uh, a project between the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies and the OSCE's Office of the Representative on the Freedom of the Media, talking to different experts around OSCE member countries on AI, disinformation, and what that means for freedom of expression. So I'm really, really pleased today to have with us John uh, David Villasenor. Uh, John is a non-resident senior fellow in governance studies at the Center for Technology and Innovation at Brookings in Washington. He's also a professor of electrical engineering, law, public policy, and management at UCLA, as well as a co-director of the UCLA Institute for Technology, Law, and Policy. Uh, John, very glad to have you on for a discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, th thank you very much for having me here. John, you're an expert in, I, I, on a whole bunch of issues related to, to emerging technology, um, public policy. It's a biting issue that every government, international org is trying to get their heads around. I'd like to, to talk to you first about your recent paper for Brookings. I know it was it dealt on a longer one, but how to deal with AI-enabled disinfo. And I'm wondering if you could just Tell us right off front, what is AI-enabled disinfo? Uh, so AI, of course, stands for artificial intelligence. Um, and then disinformation is, is, is incorrect information that is intentionally put out there um, you know, with, uh, with generally malicious intent. Uh, and so you know, one of the many concerns that we have regarding disinformation is that artificial intelligence techniques could, in some environments and situations, be used to amplify uh, the propagation uh, of disinformation, uh, and that's highly concerning because dis disinformation is is problematic generally, and all the more so uh, if you apply technology to if someone applies technology to help it propagate and spread. And John, in your paper, you talked about some of the different um, elements of a of AI disinformation, like deep fakes, uh, computational propaganda. Is this something that governments are prepared to deal with, or is it something that we really have to start bringing everyone together to start looking at how to bring, I mean, whole society approach to deal with this with this challenge? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think you know it, it, the challenge is that it's always it's always harder to play defense uh, than offense, right? And it's in some sense an arms race because uh, there are any number of tools out there that can be used to, for example, attempt to detect. Uh, AI enabled disinformation or, or disinformation generally, whether or not it's generated by artificial intelligence or not. Um, but then of course, those who are creating the disinformation also have their own toolbox, uh, which becomes more sophisticated over time. And of course, uh, the you know if you're playing defense, you're often uh, one step behind. So I do think it's, it's an issue that we want to bring together a lot of people to try to address, but even in doing that, we, we need to recognize just the sort of impossibility of doing a perfect job uh, we just want to do a better job uh, at addressing these things, but but you're never going to actually completely uh, eliminate disinformation from the online ecosystem. And, and you mentioned in your in your paper, John, that um, you cited, um, I believe, it was a Harvard um, academic, but saying it's next to impossible to fully uh, deal with disinformation to to eradicate it from social media platforms. Um, I tend to agree with that, but is that the case? Or, 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 yeah, it is. One of the challenges is, is that you, you just look at the sheer volume of information that's out there, right? And I, I don't I don't have the exact numbers, but I think last time I looked, you know, I've read that I think Twitter, I think there are thousands of tweets every second that are sent, right? And if you look at the, you know, there's I think hundreds of hours of YouTube videos uploaded every minute. Uh, and of course, most of, most of that content is not disinformation, but there's some fraction of it that is. And even if it's only a small fraction, just in... in absolute terms, uh, that's a that's a very large number, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, just as a, a sheer question of statistics, even if you were to somehow identify 80% of the disinformation, you'd still have a lot of it. I mean, the numbers are just absolutely, absolutely enormous. And then, of course, there's these, these really important questions about sort of where, where do you set your filters, right? I mean, there's 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 disinformation that everyone would agree is is harmful, you know, you know, I don't know, false medical cures, right? That, that kind of, you know, and then there's also disinformation. If I put on YouTube that I can run a sub 10 second, 100 meter dash, well, that's disinformation, but it's not particularly harmful. I mean, it's not true, but it's not harmful. And so, you know, there's a 
big spectrum, you know, just because something's false doesn't mean it's necessarily problematic for society. Um, and so you have to sort of make these decisions about where you're going to draw those lines as well. So, John, um, I mean, there's been a big focus on disinformation related to elections, related to trying to, you know, foreign interference to try to create, um, uh, you know, breakdowns of social cohesion in multiple states. But I'm wondering, have you seen um, any changes in disinformation related to the COVID pandemic? Um, is there anything that, based on your research and your work, are you seeing anything that that's changed in the last few months, if not uh, half a year? Well, there's certainly, I think the social media companies have, have made very concerted efforts to try to, uh, to try to address, you know, false you know, claims of, you know, of, of ways, you know, miracle cures for COVID or ways to avoid it and things like that. And I think they've generally done, um, you know, uh, not a perfect job, but a pretty, pretty, pretty good job. Not, not a perfect job. I think one of the, with the election disinformation, one of the most, you know, concerning things, there are many concerning things, but one of the most concerning things was you know, that, as far as I know, that actually wasn't generally generated by AI. It was generated by people right, and echoed by people. And so it was an illustrate, you know, in much of my work, I'd been worried, for example, a year ago, if you'd asked me, I would have been worried about for a possibility for, that maybe a foreign country would use AI techniques to sow disinformation with, with the goal of attempting to, for example, influence American public opinion. Um, but it actually turned out the in this particular election cycle, the greater threat was information just generated kind of organically, you know, as far as I know, without, I mean, algorithms certainly played a role in propagating it once it was out there. Um, but the actual sort of source of the information was, was, was general, disinformation was, was generally a human, human. And so, um, so it's a vexing problem. And then, you, you, you know, you, it's sobering to think if you had, you know, enormous numbers of people who wanted to, um, who were, you know, wanted to propagate information that was false and, and false in ways that were, you know, concerning, um, if that was then augmented with artificial intelligence techniques, that would be even be all the more concerning. So it's, the, you know, it's, it's a concern. So, John, it's interesting in your in your paper for Brookings, you mentioned there are kind of two tools that can be used particularly to find disinformation on Twitter uh, related to the bots. Uh, it was uh, hoaxy and now it's the botometer. Um, are there any other tools like that for other social media platforms, or is it really those are the ones that that are? No, no. I, yeah, I, I certainly didn't mean to imply, uh, and I don't think I did imply that those were sort of the only tools out there. Um, I, that I was citing those as examples in that there are. Um, there are, you know, when people create bots that are intent, attempting to mimic people, if they don't do a good job of it, then um, it's pretty easy to detect, right? You know, if, if a bot, you know, tweets something false every seven minutes exactly, right, then it's probably not too hard to figure out. But, uh, and, and, you know, but then, you know, that's the kind of simplest. And then you can imagine bots that become more and more sophisticated, um, you know, uh, and so there are, there's a roster of tools out there, uh, some of them more effective, some of them less effective. Um, but again, it's, it's an arms race. Uh, and so even the best of those tools aren't going to be uh, perfect. And then you also have to understand sort of there's the false positive, false negative trade-off, right? You don't want, that one of the, one of the problems with automated attempts to do these things is that you can also inadvertently uh, ending, end up flagging and perhaps filtering out content, which, you know, your algorithm incorrectly concluded was was disinformation maybe maybe it wasn't disinformation maybe it was accurate right but just it got fooled so it's you know um there's a dial that needs to be turned on these things and it's it's not always easy to find the right place to turn that dial so john you just you just brought something up that i think is key of of what um i would like to understand and, and my colleagues would like to understand is that sometimes algorithms on, could could take something that is not intent to spread disinformation but it will take people off of their platforms or lock their accounts. And, and, and then we get into an issue about freedom of expression, um, about how do we guarantee freedom of expression of individuals um, online when there is this kind of war going on of platforms trying to take down inauthentic accounts of, 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 of trolls online. Um, right. how, is it, how important is it to center the discussion around freedom of expression in this debate, yeah, I think it's a, it's an important question, and, and you know, um, I know you you reach an international audience, but but my knowledge is is much more grounded in, in United States, you know, law, uh, and so in the United States, uh, as as many of your viewers will know, we we have you know a First Amendment right to freedom of expression, but importantly, 
that that First Amendment right applies to the government. In, in, in other words, it, it's, it basically says the government is not allowed to abridge uh, the freedom of speech. It, it, it doesn't say anything about private entities, right? And so, um, you know, Twitter, for example, is under, you know, that, I'll put it another way, there's a lot of very offensive speech, you know, racist speech and such, uh, that is, you know, protected under the First Amendment in the sense that the government can't put you in jail for saying it, uh, but nonetheless prohibited, and rightly so, on these social media platforms, right? So most people would agree that Facebook and Twitter, for example, have a right to have terms of service which say, hey, if you, you know, you know, you, you know, if you propagate racist speech, we're going to, you know, cut off your account. Most people would agree that that they they are within their rights to do that, and so. The, you know, while um, freedom of expression is, as a you know, in general, extremely important, I think it's important to also recognize that social media companies, as private entities, do have latitude uh, to make decisions about the kind of content uh, that they allow and are free to, for example, prohibit offensive content that a government could not prohibit. You know, a state government could not prohibit. Um, and so, I think the freedom of sometimes in this dialogue, there's this sort of people sort of jump straight to this sort of question of, well, hey, you know, doesn't Facebook have an obligation to sort of support free expression? Uh, and, you know, not in a sort of strictly legal sense, they don't, right, um, as a private entity. And, but, you know, and the, the, there are interesting questions about sort of the limits of that. So anyway, that's a, you know, it, while in, in, in every way, I am a very strong believer in the right to freedom of expression and the fact that people should have the right, you know, subject to the the obvious normal limits uh, to express, you know, a diversity of, of views and opinions. Um, social media companies aren't required to be vehicles for uh, for for everything that is possibly legal to say under the First Amendment. So um, I know the U.S. is particular with the Constitution, um, and it's slightly different from other Western democracies. We're having a debate in Canada right now. The government's going to put out legislation to deal with online hate, disinformation. Um, do you think that other countries should be prudent uh, at putting pressure on on the big tech giants, or is it something they should have an actual real dialogue and find out, like the way? I, well, I, I think a dialogue. I think a dialogue is, is is really important. I think when you know when, and this applies whether it's in the United States or anywhere else. I think when you when you talk about governments putting pressure on tech companies, you know, we have to understand that that's a double-edged sword, right? Um, you know, you, you know, think about in, in whatever country, you know, a viewer might be in, the politician you most disagree with, right? And would you want that person having the authority to make decisions about what content is or isn't available uh, in your country? And so um, there is, you know, the proverbial slippery slope that, you know, once you get the government sort of putting its hand in and turning the dials, you know, put, putting aside legally, whether the government can do that in any given jurisdiction. And of course, in different countries, there are different rules about that. But, but once, you, once you get there, then um, it, you know, how might that power be not only used you know, in beneficial ways, for example, to force social media companies to do a better job with disinformation filtering, but also if, uh, in detrimental ways, for example, uh, by, uh, by uh, malicious people who wanted to use the power of government to limit the speech of groups or individuals for who, for whatever reason, uh, they, the government didn't want to speak. And so I think government control of social media companies is is something we want to be very, very careful about, um, you know, even though there might be some narrow cases where people say, oh, yeah, we really need more of that. So I'm, I'm very concerned with that sort of slippery slope. John, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Um, your insights are fascinating, and um, and uh, we really appreciate you spending a few minutes of your time to talk to us and share your expertise. Well, yeah, thanks very much. And sounds like you're doing some really interesting work. And uh, best of luck with it.